For the last month, I have foraged 100% of my food from the land, every single bite. Now, in order to create a complete diet and really reconnect with the earth and my plant friends, I foraged about 100 different plants as food and medicine. Today, I'm gonna to introduce you to about 40 of the plants that I connected with over the last month. Pile of manure, growing next to it, Wintercrest, Landcrest, Creasy Greens, goes by many names, but by all names, scrumptious. Coosa dogwood. Delicious. Wild rice, manomen, the food that grows on water. I give so much gratitude to the Anishinaabe people who have been the stewards of this wonderful food for hundreds or thousands of years. Without their knowledge and their stewardship, this is a plant friend that I would not have. This is my absolute staple, both to my soul and to my body, as it is the main source of calories for my month of eating 100% from the land. This is ginkgo. I am harvesting the fruits and the nuts. Goldenrod in the golden hour. This is a wonderful all-around medicinal plant to make medicinal teas from. A bounty of black walnuts in the parking lot, ready for the picking. Cleavers, and one of the ways you can identify this is if you throw it at your chest, it often sticks, just like that. And Cleavers are edible. Creeping Charlie. People consider this to be a noxious pest of a plant, but it's a wonderful medicinal and edible. Crab apples. Much to many people's disbelief, they are not poisonous. Some crab apples taste amazing, others kind of crabby. All of them worth a try. It's chickweed. You know it's chickweed because on the alternating sides, there's this little row of hairs and it tastes like sweet corn. Chicken of the woods, one of the most popular and exciting mushrooms to find. Chestnuts, I consider them sort of like a potato in the sense that they're calorically dense and take very little processing work. Hey look, I found some false strawberry. Now, it's not a false strawberry, it's a thing of its own. And it looks like a strawberry, but it doesn't have the delicious taste of a strawberry. Still worth eating though. Echinacea, I use the flowers and leaves to make an immune boosting tea. Ground cherries, which are a wonderful treat to find. They grow in these husks, just like tomatillos do. They are quite the treat. Oh. Here we have hawthorn, which looks a lot like rose hips, but I really prefer them to rose hips. And hawthorn can vary a lot from tree to tree. Some are incredible, and this one, it's all right. Hen of the woods, or maitake, a great edible mushroom and a great medicinal. Hackberries, a sweet fruit on the outside and a crunchy seed on the inside. Jewelweed, watch the seeds explode. <laughs> Autumn berries, these are considered highly invasive, so eating them is good for our ecosystems. Smartweed is another really edible weed, and it's also called ladyfinger because it has these smudges on the leaf that looks kind of like a fingerprint. Lamb's quarter, one of my favorite greens in a weed in every city. Mustard seeds, with this I can make my own mustard or just add some real nice spice to my meals. Mint, my spirit plant, and makes a refreshing minty water. This is one food that is growing everywhere. It is mulberry growing out of the cracks here in urban New York City. And most people know that the wonderful berries are delicious, but the young and tender greens also incredibly nutritious. 
This is mugwort and I use this as part of my sleepy time tea blend that I make. A plant that looks like it is ragweed and this has a silvery underleaf and also ah, a really nice smell. Mullen, tea and soft toilet paper. If it smells like onion and it tastes like onion, it's onion and this is all onion. This is Plantago and there's two species, Plantago major and Plantago minor. This is the broadleaf plantain and the other is narrowleaf plantain. So these leaves are very nutritious. They are an edible and they're a medicinal. Something I like to make from this is a poultice. So if I'm stung by a bee, a honeybee, because I'm a beekeeper, I will chew up some of these leaves and stick that where I've been stung. And that actually helps when you're, you have skin irritation from insects that have stung you. And that's called a poultice. This is poke or pokeweed and it's one of my favorite greens. This is a toxic one that you have to cook. And you only eat this when it's in its meristematic growth stage. Not when the leaves are flat, but when it's when the leaves are still pointed upwards and they're young and tender. It's not a banana, it's not a mango, it's a papa, and it's a true treat of the woods. You can tell when papa is ripe by poking it with your finger. And if it pushes in just like an avocado, when an avocado is ripe, that's how you know. Poor man's pepper, but my friend Eric Joseph Lewis taught me to call it rich man's pepper, and it makes a great pepper substitute. So Chan, if you want to eat a lot of greens, this is the green for you. Stinging nettle. The stings are medicinal and the food is wonderful. Shagbark hickory for making hickory nut milk. Violet, which is very mild and makes a great base for a salad. Wild water. Bubbling up from the earth. Wild pears. I don't find a lot of these trees compared to apples, but when I do, they are abundant. Acorns. How you eat them is you have to remove the tannins. You can do that through a hot water bath or cold water bath, leaching out the tannins. And then you get an acorn mash. You can dry that into an acorn flour. The acorn also produces the acorn grub. A tasty little treat. That's a pretty typical size for acorn grubs. Rich, acorny, nuttiness. That's good grub. The everyday, very usual, and quite abundant wild chives to be picked from front yards, parks, and wild spaces all across the land. Here the dandelion stands. It's an incredibly resilient plant. The leaves are edible. The flowers are edible. The stem is also edible. The milk inside of that, edible. And then the roots are edible as well. Young and tender amaranth, a nutritious and tasty green. Here we have dock, and the leaves of dock can be delicious or they can be downright terrible. You'll learn the different docks. This is the seed head here, and often people will use these making crackers and the root of dock can also be roasted just like you would with dandelion to make a root tea. After having apples straight from the land, a grocery store apple just feels like a vessel full of water. Apples were one of my absolute staples, harvesting dozens and dozens of them, sometimes shaking them down from the trees and harvesting the bounty, and other times just picking them. My favorite thing to make from apples is, of course, applesauce. Eating applesauce every day. Growing up, I ate blackberries and raspberries, and I didn't even consider it foraging. It was just picking berries. It's one of the most common things that people forage. Right here, I'm with blackberry, and this is one of the brambleberries, which includes blackberry and raspberry and black raspberry and thimbleberry and salmonberry, and there's more. But not only are the berries edible on these plants, but you can make tea from the leaf. Raspberry leaf tea is the most popular of all of them, and the time that you want to do it is when the leaves are young and tender. That's going to make the best tea. Aronia, or sometimes called chokeberry, not choke cherry, 
choke berry. The best way to work with it is to make a very nutritious, rich juice. This is a very commonly found landscaping plant, so it's perfect for urban foragers. Butternut, a lot like walnut, but it's a butternut. Different flavor, different shape, but very similar. Black nightshade, few edible plants create so much fear. This is a plant that millions believe is deadly, yet millions and millions of people have eaten both the leaves and the fruits as staple food for the last hundreds or thousands of years. Black nightshade berries are incredibly delicious and I enjoy them thoroughly and yet for me to explore is eating the young and tender greens, but again, something that millions of people around the world enjoy. Food and medicine is growing freely and abundantly all around us. And these plant relatives, they are just waiting for us to create relationships with them that will help us break free from the global industrial food system and live in a more harmonious way with the earth, with humanity, and with all of our plant and animal relatives. It starts by learning just one plant at a time and who knows, maybe one day you'll never have to take a trip to the grocery store again. Oh my gosh, that tree's loaded.